The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Friday, August 1st, 2014. Hello and welcome in to eBible Fellowship Questions and Answers Time, where you can interact with us with your questions and comments related to the Bible, and we'll try to respond as well as possible by going to the Bible. And so, with our Bibles at the ready, it's now time to turn things over to our speaker, Chris McCann. Good evening, Chris. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's Friday Night Question and Answer Program. Tonight, we're going to take a look at the Bible with any questions or comments that anyone may have, and each person is invited to share what's ever on your mind by contacting us in one of the ways that were just mentioned, and we'll be glad to receive your question. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible. The Bible, as it is God's Word, it is His Holy Word, his communication to mankind. If we ever want to know what is God thinking, what is in the mind of God, uh, the Bible tells us we have the mind of Christ, and it's referring to the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God that reveals the mind of God, and that's why it, it's so rich and infinite in its knowledge, uh, there there is no plumbing its depths because it, it is information that is coming forth directly from the infinite, brilliant mind of God. And and so you see, the problem that we have is that we are creatures, fallen creatures, and hopefully redeemed creatures by God's grace. Uh, if we're truly saved, and 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 so we have severe limitations when it comes to the Bible. The the Bible tells us this. God says, "My thoughts are higher than your thoughts, as the heaven, or the heavens are higher than the earth, and the heavens are quite a bit higher than the earth." And and so uh, there's the problem that mankind has. Here, God has graciously and kindly given us divine revelation, His word, His communication to mankind, and, and yet uh, he, he speaks in a superior way than our minds are capable of comprehending. And that's why we need the Spirit of God. We need the Lord's Spirit to guide us into all truth. And God has to kindly uh, condescend and knowing our frame, knowing we are but dust, knowing we're finite little tiny creatures with extremely small peanut-sized minds in comparison to his. And so God has to carefully, slowly teach us a little bit here and a little bit there. And... He has to lead us step by step in this process. But we're, we're encouraged uh, still because God's plan to open the scriptures at the time of the end, and also because God is able to open up his people's understanding in order to understand the Word of God, the Bible. And and, and so as long as God is with us, as long as he is our helper, as long as the Holy Spirit is our guide, then we can uh, have a good expectation of coming to truth. Well, at this point, we're going to open up the room and take our first call. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Good evening. I was calling about Revelation 13, 13, where it says, And he doeth great wonder, he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Yes. I'm wondering about the word wonders and the word fire and um, what we've been learning about this verse. It makes me think of 
of the wonders um, make me think of the salvation, um, the righteousness of Christ. Um, and the fire makes me think of the judgment of God. And um, from what we've been learning, I was wondering if the word wonder can be compared with um, what is being talked about in Isaiah 55, 13. Um, Isaiah 55. Uh, Mm -hmm. And verse 13, it says, Instead of the thorn shall come up the fir tree, and instead of the briar shall come up the myrtle tree. And it shall be to Jehovah for a name, for an everlasting sign that shall not be cut off. Well, I don't, I don't know if we can make the connection, except this is speaking of a sign and the word wonder um, the Greek word translated as wonders is also translated as signs, I think. I think... Um, yeah. um, I was wondering if, if this was a... Um, this is what the beast, uh, the church... Well, if they wanted salvation and they wanted righteousness and they wanted the judgment of God to come and give, you know, to say, you know, here is salvation. If you um, follow the mind of man rather than than the faithful word of God, then here is salvation, here is a wonder and a sign instead of God's sign, which is, um, you know, he changes, um, like, instead of sin, you know, there's righteousness, and instead of the thorn, there's the fir tree and so forth, but, um, um, but that the churches would want their own um, ways even to the point where they were doing the crazy things that you're speaking of, um, such as what are called signs and wonders, but are they just false signs and wonders, would you say? Oh, yes, they, they're they not true signs and wonders, um, except that uh, if there is any supernatural activity uh, with falling over backwards, or, or even speaking in tongues, it's not of God, it would be of Satan. God, um, in performing um, true signs and wonders, when the Lord Jesus Christ was on earth and did miracles, they were a testimony, uh, they were proof of who he was, and this was the true gospel. Then in the book of Acts, for a short period of time, God gave the disciples some ability to perform miracles. And uh, the Apostle Paul or, or Peter were able to do some miracles. And this was so God could verify and, and prove the gospel, that here is Christ, he's the Messiah, and uh, the degree of miracles Jesus performed has never been seen in any prophet. So he is th that prophet. He is the Messiah. And then uh, when God was establishing the church age in the first century, the gospel went out into the world and some signs, true signs and wonders were performed by the disciples, some healings and things like that, in order to establish this is the true gospel. But then once God completed the Bible, there would be no more miraculous signs, no more healings of any kind. The Bible, the Bible was it. So Satan, once he becomes... Um, the ruler over the entire church at the beginning of the Great Tribulation period goes about performing signs and wonders, lying signs. Um, God says in 2 Thessalonians 2, in verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So Satan has the ability to perform lying signs. Even if there is supernatural activity on the part of Satan, it's still a lying sign 
because the claim is this is coming from God. And it's not. It, it, in no way is it coming from God. But Satan, uh, either through deceit or um, uh, supernatural activity on, on his part or on demons' part, are able to verify their gospel at the time of the end through signs and wonders. Look what we can do. We can make you fall backward. We can have people speak in tongues or, or whatever. The, these things are there to make the impression this is the true gospel, just as God did early in the first century. And, and of course, it isn't. It, 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 it's actually, um, once we see those things, once a child of God sees that kind of activity, we know the opposite is true. Well, I know that that the Lord does uh, did do such things, you know, walk upon the water and so forth. But to me, you know, when I see, um, like for example, um, 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 Elisha or Elijah um, with the four hundred fifty prophets of Baal, and he's putting a sacrifice upon an altar, and the Lord is accepting the sacrifice. It's like this is no matter what signs are around, it all rests, doesn't it, all on the one um, miracle of the um, offering of Christ where the judgment of God was um, was being um, transacted and affected and so, and on and so on. And um, all, that's where the power of our life of, um, comes from, right? So... Um, even if you saw Christ walk on water, it's like that's still just what your eyes see. So in faith, you're supposed, we're supposed to look at um, the invisible sacrifice of Christ, which is righteousness, you know, his righteousness. So the, the, the fact of these wonders is kind of um, 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 it's strange to my mind. I can't really wrap my mind around. Even though I was in, you know, the tongues movement when I was young, still, um, I guess to me the the final word in my thoughts are that it just uh, there's there may be things that may be seen or experienced, whether they're psychological or whether they're um, supernatural, like you're suggesting. Well, still, they just have no um, they have no fine find out there's nothing to them. They're, you can't look at them. It, that's the way I feel. I mean, it's good to discuss them, but there's nothing to be seen, really, except if you don't see by faith, there's nothing there, really. Oh, yeah, there, there is nothing, nothing there for the true believer. It's a horrible thing for a true believer, and I think that's one of the reasons why God says in 1 Corinthians 14 that tongues are for a sign in verse 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So, um, again, th this is a sign to the unbeliever that, oh, this is God. This is God. That, oh, this is, uh, you know, regular church during the church age is boring to the unbeliever. The Bible is, is sort of dull to read to the unbeliever. It, it, it's just a book. But when you can go to church and, and everybody's dancing in the aisles, when you can go to church and, and suddenly uh, the Spirit of God overtakes someone and they start uh, speaking in a tongue, and, and another interprets, and wow, God is bringing fresh, new revelation. You know how the world is. They love a new thing. Everything that's new, that's all we want. And, and, and so it just plays on the natural mindedness of people. They, they want entertainment. They want a new thing. They, they want an exciting gospel, 
and well, okay, we'll give it to you. And and now people are falling down backwards. They're slain in the spirit. It's um, it's action packed. So time spent at church isn't so boring. Well, of course, th- that's for the unsaved. It's a sign for them. The true believer, God has given a different spirit, another spirit. We, we have a desire to read the Bible, to hear the Bible, to study the Bible, to learn from the Bible. And the Bible becomes an exciting thing to the child of God. It becomes a wonderful, beautiful thing. And uh, a lot of people do not understand that who are professed Christians. It, it's not something they've ever experienced because the Bible has basically been a closed book to them. And, and so they don't, uh, they don't experience the excitement that the, the child of God experiences just from doing a word search. Uh, but thank you for calling and sharing those verses and your question and comments. And let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our Friday night question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Could you please read Psalm 95, verses 8 and 9, and Exodus 17, verses 7? Psalm 95, verse 8, says, Harden not your heart, as in the provocation, and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. And then Exodus 17, 7, Yes. And he called the name of the place Massa in Meribah because of the chiding of the children of Israel, and because they tempted Jehovah, saying, Is Jehovah among us or not? Could you comment Excuse on how the Israelites in the wilderness began to um, doubt the presence of God even after they saw his works? Well, that's actually a good uh, a follow-up topic to what we we're just talking about signs and wonders and how the church today um, wants to see God they they lack faith you know the Bible says all men have not faith and th- that's actually a true statement all men naturally have not faith it's only when God gives us the gift of faith that we have faith. And, and so uh, the natural-minded man wants to see God. He, he doesn't have real faith, as Hebrews 11 tells us. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And so man naturally lacks that, and, and he w- therefore wants to see God. So show me God. It is God here, then, then let me see you speak in tongues. Prove it. If is God here, then I want to see people falling over backwards. I want to see the activity of the Holy Spirit, who is God. I want to see God physically, visibly working in the congregation. And yet, that's always a disaster. It never um, does any good spiritually to a person, even if people did see God working. And in the case of Israel, they saw the hand of God in dramatic ways as God brought the mighty nation of Egypt to its knees, as God destroyed the greatest army on earth and its king, Pharaoh, in the Red Sea. They, they saw plagues that no natural occurrence could ever explain. That, and plague after plague after plague, which took place exactly when Moses, the spokesperson for God, said they would take place. And then those plagues ended exactly when Moses said they would end. And, and so uh, if there was ever an opportunity for someone to become saved through 
seeing God do mighty works and and mighty signs, you know, uh, tremendous acts demonstrating his his uh, being that he exists, that he is who he says he is, that he is the Almighty God, and and so forth. If ever there was a stage where that could be tested, if only I could see God, then I would be saved. Well, it was the events that took place in Egypt, and then even coming out of Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, and and even further, water coming out of a rock, manna falling from heaven, shoes on our feet that never wore old, and so forth. Miracle after miracle after miracle, and what was the result? A nation full of murmurers, a nation full of people who lacked faith even to trust God for a, a period of a few days. They, they complained, they murmured, they doubted, and, and God sums it up. He, he tells us that the overwhelming majority of Israelites that were delivered out of Egypt and therefore of people that saw the mighty hand of God do all these works, these mighty signs, they were unsaved and they perished in the wilderness. Why did they perish in the wilderness? Well, let's turn to Hebrews, Hebrews 3, and in verse 17, but with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not with them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest? But to them that believe not. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief. That is, no faith. And they didn't have the faith of Christ. And therefore, all men have not faith, the Bible says. So they could not enter in. And it doesn't matter what outward physical manifestations or signs and wonders are done. It will never, never get one sinner to believe. Never. And, and that's why, the, the, uh, besides being completely rebellious, the, the church's direction going after these charismatic gospels to show God to their congregation is completely vain. It, it's a complete waste of time and effort if it were genuine and sincere and their desire to, um, through that, have people saved. No one will ever become saved through that, it, it will never happen. Now, God tells us in an interesting place, the, the rich man who is in hell, in, in the grave, in Luke 16. And the rich man wants God to send Lazarus to his brethren. And, and we read in Luke 16, verse 27, Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that uh, he's speaking to Father Abraham, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now who's Moses and the prophets? Moses uh, was used to write the first five books of the Bible, and the prophets would be the rest of the writings of the Old Testament. They have the Scripture. They have the Bible, is what God is saying. Let them hear them. And then it says in verse 30, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. You see the, the thinking of the natural-minded? Oh, raise him from the dead. Here comes someone from the dead, and then they'll see the, this resurrected person. 
they'll see that he was dead and now is alive. Well, did that work in the life of the actual Lazarus? This Lazarus is um, a man in a parable. But the actual Lazarus in the Gospel of John was raised from the dead. And, and he did walk amongst the Jews. And they knew, they knew he was dead. He was dead for four days. Everybody knew he was dead. And what, what a spectacular sign. What a spectacular wonder. What a spectacular miracle it is that this man, who everyone knew, it, it's not like a gimmick of some kind. It, it wasn't some uh, shanty, underhanded um, magic trick. Everybody knew that he was dead. They, they were weeping for him. They, they saw his body. And, and by this time, the statement was made, he stinketh because he was in a tomb. Everyone knew without any question that that man was dead. And then the Lord Jesus rose him, resurrected Lazarus from the dead. He came forth and there you go. Now everybody's going to believe Jesus is Christ. Jesus is Messiah. God is true. All the Jews fall down and worship and bow down to the Almighty because now there can be no question, no doubt. Is that what happened? No. What happened was the leaders of the Jews consulted together to put Lazarus to death because of him, many people were believing. And were not to think that people became saved, but just they, they were probably talking and reasoning because it was such a spectacular thing. But, but look at the unsaved within Israel. It didn't affect them at all. It, it made no spiritual difference to them. And so this rich man in the grave is suggesting the same thing to God. But notice the response in Luke 16, verse 31. And he said unto him, and this is Father Abraham really um, standing in the place of God here. He said unto him, if they hear not Moses and the prophets, that is my word, the Bible, neither will they be persuaded the one rose from the dead. And there God is making a tremendous contrast. God gives his word, the Bible. That is sufficient. That is what will bring a person to belief. And if they do not hear the Bible, if they dismiss the Bible, if they are bored by the Bible, if the Bible is a dull, um, just strange book to them, they can't understand it, they don't really like to read it, and, and they want something else, well, uh, that's it. That's all you get. That's all God has determined to give the world since the Bible was completed. His grace is sufficient. His word is sufficient that's in this book, the Bible. It's all that is necessary, and, and nothing else would do any good anyway. Nothing else will convince a sinner. Nothing else will, will cause them to believe if they don't believe the Bible. And remember what God said? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And, and, and so there's where faith enters into someone's life through the slow, tedious process of reading the Bible, of hearing the Bible, and, and no other way. Well, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you for calling and sharing those verses. And I would like uh, to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Lord willing, this coming Sunday, we'll have our online fellowship Sunday afternoon, 12 to about 3 p.m., and during that time, we'll have another question and answer program. 
like this. Uh, also, please keep in mind, if you live in the California area, the weekend of August 9th and 10th, Saturday and Sunday, Lord willing, eBible Fellowship hopes to hold um, a weekend Bible conference, a mini conference, or a weekend day in the Word in Sacramento, California. Uh, all are invited, all are welcome. Uh, there's, there's no charge for attending. We would like to know you're coming so we can make uh, other preparations. So if you're interested in attending, please send an email to ebiblefellowship at juno.com and, and, and just tell us um, your name and, and maybe how many people you think are coming with you. And uh, we'll, we'll also give you any information that you might want uh, concerning nearby hotels or, or where the conference is located. Well, thank you once again for being with us. And at this point, I'll say good night. And may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thanks for joining us again for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your speaker, Chris McCann. You can join us for these Questions and Answers sessions Sunday afternoon following Sunday studies and Monday and Friday evenings following the Monday and Friday evening studies. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.